Hello there and welcome to Complete Games. I'm James and we continue with the note read through from Santiago on Genesis. If you haven't already seen part one, I'll leave a link in the top right hand corner. But we continue where we left off with Santiago having suspicions he may in fact be a clone. So sit back, relax and enjoy part two of the note read through from Santiago. So I confronted Uma and she confirmed that I am a clone of the original Santiago. And yeah, they gave me false memories to cover up for the time it took to back up my personality and grow a new body to put it in. Wish I could say she seemed remorseful while confirming my most paranoid fears. Uma just stood back and waited while I flipped out. Once I'd worn myself out, she pointed out that they were trying to save the world here. In Uma's mind, the ends justified whatever means were necessary. They'd already restored me from a backup by the time I joined Genesis, on the condition that they didn't put me in their archive. She said I'd been given a leadership role as important as any human ever had. There were politicians and military commanders who dreamed their whole lives of being able to make a difference or leave a legacy like I would. Was she expecting gratitude? Imagine that. There's not much I can do about this extra life I've been given, especially knowing that they can just bring me back again from their archive. In a way, the transhumans in the United Republic of Earth sort of got their revenge on me by extending my life and using their damn technology. Some people would be glad for another chance to get things right, but I had my time in the sun. Uma tells me I died a hero the first time around, that I helped end the war. I guess I'll have to take her word for it, since they didn't let me remember how that went down. I remember a childhood in Sao Paulo, a life spent designing tech gear and munitions for the feds, but I'm not really that guy anymore, am I? If my engram is cloned again to colonize some alien world in the far future, that Santiago wouldn't remember this version of me either. Maybe he'd be better off that way. When I told Yunki that Uma confirmed everything, I reminded the kid that unlike him I always had clearance to look up my own file. Yunki told me that he had searched the database for his own name and found his husband and daughters there in the archive. It looked to him like they had been scanned and emulated from the moment they had arrived here to live and work, consent or not. He said he shouldn't have expected any less from the enemy, and I had to remind him that we weren't enemies anymore. The poor kid looked haunted and desperate, but I think, I hope, I can manage to talk him off the ledge and back into the fold. We need him to help us finish Genesis if we're going to save the world. Never saw Uma as an impulsive type, but this morning she cleared our schedules and took me for a day trip to see the farm. We borrowed a plane from the project fleet, so we could hop on an orbital shuttle out of Jakeet. I hadn't left the surface in years, and I embarrassed myself with a bout of zero-g sickness. If Uma was disappointed in me, she didn't let it show. The farm was over the Serengeti when we caught up with it. After all the time I'd spent arguing with biotechs over species inclusion, it was strange to walk through some paddocks and see the genuine article up close. I stopped to touch a newly cloned mammoth calf, and it wrapped his trunk around my wrist. Wasn't expecting to feel a connection to some lab animal, but it felt like neither of us wanted to let go. Two lost souls dragged back from oblivion, holding on to each other in orbit. While we were up on the farm, I tracked down Alicia to ask if there was any way to decontaminate all the soil and rock being hauled into orbit. She said I was asking her for the impossible. Of course raw element was going to be raised from the surface, along with veins of every other metal. There's no existing technology to remove xenotoxins from that volume of material. At least not in the time frame we're dealing with. That got me thinking about using mechs to clean up our biomes over the long haul. We really had no idea how long it was going to take for our colony ship to find a habitable world. It could end up jumping around the galaxy for a millennia. Decontamination would be a huge job, calling for herds of machines roaming the ship's interior. Before I knew it, I was sketching a tech version of a giant Pleistocene horse we'd seen striding across one of the farm's pastures. The farm is a prototype for the artificial biomes in our colony ship and for Uma's arc network. Oh right, forgot to mention that on our way back to Earth, Uma told me that the transhumans are going ahead with their arc concept as soon as we get our colony ship off the ground. They figure a diversity of plans gives the best long-term odds for humanity's survival. 
they want to use a version of our archive in the network of satellite proving grounds, where they can test life forms for optimal survival outcomes. Once they pick their best candidates, they hope to detoxify and reseed the Earth from orbit. I was surprised to hear about the transhumans planning to repopulate with regular non-augmented humans. I guess the idea of researching dead people in clone bodies is kind of transhumanism, but I can't help noticing their plan to rebuild the world doesn't seem to include themselves. Not sure what to make of that. Our research and development mechanics were already hard at work, building out tools and gear for our future generational crew, so I felt bad piling on. I wouldn't have bothered them if I didn't think my design was worth adding to the R&D workload. There's no way a human crew could find and remove every trace of raw element contamination from the biomes on our colony ship without automation on a massive scale. What good is authority though, you can't abuse it for a worthy cause. Besides, I have to admit it feels good to design something that's not some kind of military tech. I like the idea of those things scrubbing away every trace of toxin I'd once helped pollute battlefields with. I probably shouldn't have kept my idea off the books for now, but I feel like Uma won't shut this down once she sees a real world prototype of my Strider concept. Shared my Strider idea with Alicia over a secure channel, and she gave me some great feedback for improving the concept. She suggested tricking out my mech workhorses with interchangeable instrument arrays for more functionality, and to throw in manual control in case our ship's crew wants to saddle them up for any odd jobs in the future. Good thinking. I winced when she said she wished she had one of my striders back when she was sampling battlefield containment. But she probably has no idea that I designed a lot of the weapons that caused the damage she used to study. At least, I hope she doesn't. I signed off after promising Alicia a strider or two to try out on the farm. I'm curious if something that big clamping around would disrupt the artificial ecosystem they've got going up into orbit. Still can't believe I managed to talk Uma into taking the day off to try hover sailing with me. She claimed she'd never been on one, but she picked it up without my help. Didn't need me to show her how to keep balance or how to lean back against the wind. Maybe she can just download any skill she needs, on demand. What would that be like? Over dinner, I was telling her how I'd ridden the windward wall of El Chero Gorge when she just sort of blipped out on me. It was like someone else was looking at me through Uma's eyes. She asked me why I'd been diverting R&D resources for a mech prototype. I wriggled like a germ under a microscope. I must have managed a convincing defense of my Strider idea because Uma was back again just as fast as she'd gone away. She nodded and went back to sparring cauliflower with a fork like nothing had happened. After that weirdness with Uma last night, it's obvious I've never really gotten to know her at all. All that conscious stuff we humans have to do in our waking lives must be automatic for transhumans. Listening to each other, shooting the shit, making plans. I doubt they have to think about any of that unless they want to, any more than we need to concentrate on breathing. I'll probably never get how she or any of them really thinks or feels, but I feel like I've been wasting my time even trying. It was their idea to bring me back and stuck me here. Have they only ever noticed me when I've managed to annoy them? Maybe I'd finally have their full attention if I went into central processing right now and deleted their precious archive. It'd serve them right if I walked in there and just set off an EMP right in the middle of the whole damn thing. Okay, I've calmed down. Hurt feelings aside, I'd never do anything to risk this project. I've totally bought into our mission here. I've spent too much of my life breaking things, and it matters to me that I've been given the chance to make amends. I owe it to my species to try and help us escape extinction. If our shot at survival means I have to swallow my dumb pride, then it's no contest. I'm only human, more or less. They cloned me against my will and gave me a bunch of fake memories to cover that up, but supposedly because they needed me to be part of this. Uma more or less said I was a natural leader, so that has to count for something. Maybe I actually envy my transhuman benefactors a little. It must be great to be able to set aside all their feelings and really focus on what it's going to take to save the world. I was nosed down again in Orbital Manifest when Yunki asked me to come and try some new training sim he was running in the Genesis engine. I hadn't checked in on the kids since he'd figured out he'd been archived against his will, 
so I dragged myself across the campus to his lab. He plugged us into his sim, but it looked like one of the same Arctic scenarios he'd already run by me. Yunki dialed something in midair, and the wind started howling louder. Then he leaned in so far our hoods were almost touching, and he said he needed a place to talk where no one could hear us. He wanted to know if Uma had gotten to me. I told him he was way out of line. After a long pause, he asked if I'd sit with him when he confronted her about the recording thing. I said sure, and he killed the sim. On the way back to my office, I wondered if he might have left me on the ice otherwise. So the three of us met this morning, and Uma admitted that she shouldn't have recorded Yunki for archiving without his consent. Then she gave him the same pitch I'd gotten, about how vital he was to humanity's survival and the ends justifies the means. Yunki called Uma inhuman. She asked how she could prove to him that she cared, and the kid challenged her to come out drinking with us. All night, Yunki kept clumsily trying to pry information out of Uma. That backfired on him when she finally got tired of his badgering, and let us know how little time anyone on Earth actually has left. After we absorbed that news, Yunki said he'd rather spend the remaining years with his family. She told him she'll accept his resignation only if he still feels the same way when he sobers up. He swore he was going to stumble back on sight and resign at the crack of late afternoon tomorrow, but I really hope he doesn't. This morning I spotted Yunki walking through the headquarters, looking as pale as a ghost. I could see he wasn't just hungover. I knew that look because I'd been there myself, just recently. He was wandering in the direction of the archive until I steered him into my office instead. Yunki looked past me, muttering about how he had just quit. I hugged him to show I understood. Then he whispered something from my ears only, something I knew I wouldn't forget as long as I lived, which as it turned out was about half a second longer as long as it took his vest to blast us into superheated plasma. But now all those chunks of us are reversing direction and reintegrating, so Uma can lean in and try to hear Yunki's last words. And now we're flying apart again, passing through her like she isn't there, because of course, she wasn't in my office when this actually happened. I stopped existing at the point of that explosion, or really, really soon afterwards. I'm just an emulation of the late Santiago 2.0 now, that Uma's running in her damned Genesis engine. Sucks to be me, huh? Uma reintegrates me one last time in the simulation of my ruined office, so she can ask what Yunki's last words were to me to finish her post-mortem. I think I feel sorry to disappoint her. There wasn't time for my neural interface to record whatever the kid said. I threw the question back at her and asked what he'd said when he resigned. Uma says Yunki hated that he couldn't stop her kind from resurrecting his family in some strange future. A future that wasn't theirs. There's no recognisable human emotion in her avatar's face, but maybe that's just a glitch in my emulated perception. Then Uma surprises me by apologising for keeping secrets and for failing to keep me safe. She thanks me for all the work I've done for Genesis and wishes future versions me better luck when and whenever they wake up. I tell her, don't worry about me, I'm a survivor. That actually gets a smile out of her. I'll try and hold on to this feeling as she shuts me down. So that concludes all of the Explorer notes from Santiago on Genesis Part 2. We will of course be continuing with the rest of the crew's Explorer notes, so don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so, and you're enjoying the Genesis content from myself. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games, and I'll see you.